I'm Anna Smith and welcome to Girls on Film. This episode was recorded in front of an audience at the London Podcast Festival 2021. We had a wonderful night. I do hope you enjoy listening. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello, hello. Welcome. How are you all? Yes, welcome to Girls on Film. It's so lovely to be here in person. And thank you all so much for coming out. I'm Anna Smith. I'm the host of Girls on Film. As you might know, because you're here, Girls on Film is a film review podcast from the female perspective. So we often have great film critics on and also fabulous female filmmakers. This conversation is being recorded for Girls on Film podcast, so you can hear it quite soon. And this is episode 91, which I can barely believe myself. Well done, team. If anyone can claim to have listened to every single episode, I'll buy you a drink afterwards. Uh, We are very pleased to be back. Now, over lockdown, I certainly watched more TV. Did anyone else watch more TV? Yes, okay. And also, the quality of TV is so great now. So we have started covering more TV on Girls on Film. Makes sense, right? There's so much great work from great women. So alongside film today, we are also going to talk to some different guests who've worked in film and TV. They each have very different experiences, but all have found a way to do really interesting female focus. Work. As you might know, they are the fabulous Daisy Haggard, <laughs> Chinenya Azudu, and Alice Seabright. I will soon be welcoming them to the stage, but I'm going to start with saying a little bit about what we've been up to because I haven't seen people in real life for such a long time. So we did a live show at Latitude Festival, which was incredible. That was our first live show with an audience. You can hear that now on the pod. We had Kerry Fox on, who's amazing. I also went to Cannes Film Festival in person, which was a strange but wonderful experience. I also saw the Palm Door winner, Titan. It would take far too long to explain that film right now, but it's completely bonkers and brilliant. And London Film Festival is going to be showing that in October, along with a lot of female directed projects, which I think you're going to like. Um, one I will pick out, which is just screened at Venice, which I reviewed for Deadline, is True Things, directed by Harry Woodliffe, friend of the podcast, starring the great Ruth Wilson. So, True Things, put that on your radar if you're going to LFF. If you're off to the cinema at the moment, we have a few things we would recommend. Wildfire by Kathy Brady. This is a very powerful drama about a missing woman who comes home to her sister. There's a film called Co-Pilot by Anne Zora Berashad. This is about a Turkish woman who marries a fundamentalist who becomes a terrorist. Then there's Respect, which many of you might have heard of. We spoke to Liesl Tommy, the director, on the podcast. That interview's coming soon. And that, of course, is the story of Aretha Franklin starring Jennifer Hudson. Really entertaining film, also very moving. And then there's a film Herself, which is out now. That's Phila Deloitte's uplifting story of a domestic abuse survivor who builds her own home. You can watch our interview on YouTube with the BFI with the cast and crew for that. And you can listen to our interview with Phila on episode 85 of The Pod. Now, time to introduce some guests. Our first is a prolific actress and writer who's the creator, writer and star of Back to Life. Yes. On TV, you'll have seen her in Breeders, Green Wing, love that, Peep Show and Episodes. She's also known for her voice work in Harry Potter and for the film I Give It a Year. The first series of Back to Life is on iPlayer and Netflix and the full second series has just gone up on iPlayer and it's had very, very good reviews. Before I bring on the fabulous Daisy Haggard, let's see a clip. Six weeks out. How are you coping with life outside the facility? I am on it like a car bonnet. Why is everything so fucking hard? You're the Mary Mass. Yeah. Big fan. Great. I'm your mentor slash namaste. Do you mean nemesis? One foot wrong and you're back in prison. Things are good. I am moving on. I forgive you. I forgive you. No, you don't. No, you don't. Ah! I didn't know Billy had a new. Oh, no, we're not t- together. Well, not. So you haven't even... No, please. Oh. You're a dark horse, aren't you? I brought you some... Chlamydia. I'm Hyde's most hated woman. You are fairly divisive. Do you wish you were someone else? <laughs> what? I've got this deep sense of foreboding. Big man's back in town. Why are you here? It was their home before somebody grievously murdered their only child. Fury that she gets to live begin a life when she took my little girl from me and I want to destroy her. 
Please welcome Daisy Haggard. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you for having Your me. Your debut. Lovely to have you on the show. And congratulations on Back to Life. How's it going? Yeah, it's going okay. It's quite scary when you put a show out there. You suddenly, the day before, you think, oh no, why did I do that? <laughs> But it's had really great reviews, really good buzz, lots of people excited about it. And I personally find it very gripping as well as funny. It's really kind of addictive viewing. Oh, good. How did it come about? Because I know you co-wrote this, obviously, with your writing partner. Yes. Um, well, I had the idea originally and I was sort of pushing a baby around in a buggy. Um, in fact, no, before then I was pregnant, staying at my parents' house, thinking I was going to kill my dad because he kept telling me how to load the dishwasher. <laughs> And then um, also have always been obsessed with, you know, how, how we vilify women who have committed a crime and how there's sort of weird sex demon pictures of them going, you know, or, you know why, why we just cannot cope with women uh, doing something bad. So those two things created the idea, which I then pitched to um, the two brothers and we got a little pilot, you know, we sort of got to, we sort of wrote a taster tape, which we shot. But then I was pushing a buggy around with a kid in it thinking, well, this is never going to happen. And then... And then it finally did. It happened. <laughs> Actually, it's so interesting that you said that because I felt that obviously Miri experiences a lot of gendered reactions to her crime and that does yeah. seem to be a theme throughout the show. Can you talk to me in a bit more detail about that and about what kind of things you chose to highlight specifically in the show and why do you think people are that way? Is it pure sexism? I mean, what's that I about? think that we just don't... We, we want women to be perfect, don't we, I think. Yeah. I think as a society and I think that... I was always just quite outraged by that. Whereas it feels like sometimes when a man commits a crime, it's sort of put down to, oh, well, you know. <laughs> he's rotter. A, rotter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whereas there's something very unforgiving about, you know, we just immediately assume that they are evil. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I, it is sexism, right? I mean, it's, yeah. and it's a sort of wanting women to be angels. Uh, you know, you're either an angel or you're a, or the devil. You're not allowed to be something in between or a human. <laughs> and obviously the media, unfortunately, plays quite a part in that. And you yeah. explore that in the show. Yeah. What, did you use any real life cases for inspiration in that? Not particularly. It was more than I was always obsessed. I mean, and they do it with men too. But when you see the picture of somebody when they've done something bad, it's always like an amazingly awful picture, isn't it? They yeah. always pick, they don't pick the nice picture. They pick like the... <laughs> yeah. Um, so we really enjoyed going through my teenage posing photos to pick the one that would look <laughs> most like the killer. That was fun. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, and, and then I and then I spoke to lots of women uh, who had been in prison about their life when they came home and about how, you know, it's hard enough if you're a single woman in your mid to late 30s living with your parents who hasn't got a job, but then, you know, throw in the fact that you've killed someone. Um, you know, what would that be like? And so I had some really interesting conversations. So I presume a lot of the comedy was drawn from your own real life situation of living at home. Well, yeah, I mean, the good thing was is you have this sort of enormous premise and then you can just, then it's just real relationships, isn't it? It's, yeah, the dishwasher thing is a big thing with my dad. <laughs> and even after watching it, he didn't get the hint. He still rinses his plates way too much. <laughs> but yeah, so the fabric of that. But my mum has not gone out with my ex-boyfriend. I'm so really that's relieved <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She doesn't do that. <laughs> well, your mother, of course, is played by the great Geraldine James. Yeah. What an incredible actress. Talk to me a bit about the inspiration for her character, because she's transgressive in her own way. Yeah. And um, again, something we don't see very often, women of that age on screen. Yeah, well, I felt there was this thing about, you know, I, I really wanted to see and explore the sexuality of a woman of her age rather than it being mine you know in, in the sense Mary's a complete innocent I mean she, she once gave someone a hand job a long time ago but she's <laughs> sort of you know she's very 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 innocent sexually and I and I love the idea that this sort of woman that looked like something else because we that's what people would expect was that she's this sort of very sexual passionate being and it felt really really important that that was that she was the sex story of the, of the show if there was going to be one sorry Geraldine <laughs> <laughs> and her casting is tremendous Tremendous. She's um, amazing. Yeah. I mean, did you kind of adjust the role once you'd cast her or speak to her about the development of the character? She was always going to be that part, really. Yeah. She's played my mum like three times. Oh, has she? Three yeah. times now? I my thought it was quite a jealous. familiar scenario. <laughs> yeah. How funny. We got on really well. And I, I just, she was in my head because I, I really enjoyed writing for her because I knew her. And of course, Adia Lakhtar, oh, who is fantastic. Amazing. I love that he's the love interest in this. Was he always in your mind? He wasn't actually... But the moment I saw it, because I didn't, well, I had lots of different people in my mind. And then I saw something, I can't remember what it was, but I saw him and I was like, oh my gosh, it has to be him. But how are we going to get him to do this? So I wrote like a really long email to his agent or something going, hi. What were you looking for for that character then? It's just a real sweetness and a real innocence. And, and because I thought that the relationship, oh, the relationship evolved because once he came on board, I then rewrote the end of the whole 
first season ah. in a hurry me and Laura went oh no we have to do this we have to it has to be him he has to be there yes. it doesn't have to be a normal love story it's about friendship it's about mm -hmm. companionship so uh, but but yeah looking for that sort of vulnerability and that and that yeah sweetness and innocence I think well I do feel that we don't see that enough on screen in male characters do you feel strongly when you're writing things like this about kind of bucking trends and about portraying things a bit differently yeah I don't think it's particularly knowing it's just knowing what I want to watch so mm. when I'm you know when we're writing I think we think about what we would like to see and I suddenly found myself excited about writing you know Caroline having Geraldine be the sexual being of the series having the the central love relationship being really innocent just felt right I guess that's kind of at the root of a lot of what we do it's you know it's what you want to see yeah um, because it isn't done enough or it's what we as women w appreciate and I love that you know I love that the female relationship is something I'm obsessed with. My female friendships are incredibly important to me. And you're also the showrunner yeah. on this. What does that actually involve? It means you're really bossy, I think. <laughs> I think it means that you get to say, oh, so sorry, but this is what it's like in my head. <laughs> and then you hope people... <laughs> so you're on set all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. You're on set all the time. And in the edit, you know, you're very much part of that. You're part of everything, basically. But not directing, because Ella Jones was the most amazing director. But yeah, you're kind of part of it all. And what are you up to at the moment? What else? I'm having a break. But then I'm going to start shooting the second season, a third season of Breeders. The third series, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you look back at your career, is there anything that you're particularly pleased with from a feminist perspective and from a kind of female perspective? Any roles that stand out for you? I think actually just getting this show made, yeah. looking around on set, when we were on set recently and going, oh my God, we've got a female director, we've got a female DOP, we've got a female producer, we've got, like, there's all these amazing, kind, strong, brilliant women in charge. And uh, that was a really proud moment or a great moment, I think. So it's about collaboration, isn't it? Because exactly, um, because it's not just you. Like, it's all about collaboration. You get way too much credit when you have your name on it like that. But the truth is, it's, it's all undoable without all these brilliant people. It's completely about collaboration. And what are the challenges of actually starring while you're show running? Weirdly, I sort of think less about that. I think mostly about, like, is everything working? Is the scene working and all that? And then I go, oh, God, I haven't learned my lines. <laughs> <laughs> so mostly just trying to learn your lines while you're thinking about everything else. Did you always want to do both, be in front of and behind the camera? I think there's a, you know, when you're writing, there is an irresistible temptation to write a good female part because you spend your whole life as an actor going up for parts that are, you know girls that don't go like that and don't say much <laughs> so yeah you, yeah I think it's probably something I always wanted to do my friend actually just sent me a photo of a, a new year's resolution like a, an ambition I wrote at 18 and it said to write and <laughs> create your own show oh, and I was yay. like oh I forgot I said that congratulations <laughs> so that was nice. you've achieved your teenage ambition that's fantastic <laughs> when you started out in comedy in particular I mean mm. did you feel that there was a greater disparity sort of between gender than you see now do you think things have moved on I do think things have moved on even from three years ago because when I the first season came out everybody just talked about the last show that a woman had been in you know and I feel like now finally there is a change um a coming and it's not enough yet we need a lot more in many factors of this industry but I think that um I think that there yeah I think there's a change happening and have you noticed a difference in the kind of things that are sent to you in terms of scripts etc yeah the parts people seem to be finally realizing that actually women characters are really interesting and people want to see them. <laughs> I think female characters are you know are as valid <laughs> it's funny isn't it yeah. it's, it's so weird we're over 50 percent of the population but it's still a penny know, it's taken so long and, um, but it does yeah feel I mean like even since we started girls on film two years ago I feel like things have moved on which is kind of what we've been fighting for yeah but it's fantastic to see and I speak to people like you and they say yeah I'm getting sent more scripts with interesting female characters so totally like, yeah that the things people want to make seem to be just much more finally finally there's a change I think I feel that just just interestingly just from the first season to this season which there was a two-year break I can feel the change that's really interesting a little bit. I mean I mean there's, yeah. a, there's a hell of a way to go what advice would you give someone who's looking to get into your area of the industry or your areas I would just say keep doing it and do your own thing and just keep on working and if you really want to do it, you'll know because you will keep going. And if you don't, you'll stop. <laughs> and I think for some reason, I always gave up on everything, but I didn't give up on this. Although there were a few moments where I nearly did. But I think, you know, just keep on going. Make your own things. Be proactive. Don't wait for anything to come to you. And do you have a preference between TV and film? Is there a conscious thing about what, what you, area you decide to work in? Or is it something that just whatever comes along? No, I'm obsessed with film. We, I, yeah. we, we watch a film like a night quite often. Like I'm obsessed. But I um, but TV is, is really exciting at the moment. And I don't have a preference. I love them both. But um, I'm dying to write a film. Oh, are you? What yeah. Can you tell us what all that would I be mean, a spoiler? No, well, I basically, I mean, I want to write a thing from like 
Jaws, which obviously I can't write because it's been done quite well. But can you do? <laughs> you know what? You could do a feminist version of Jaws. Feminist Jaws. Because yeah. I saw that the other day again on a boat, which was a great place to see it. But I was like, oh, okay, there are a lot of issues for, as yes. a woman with this film, yeah, even though it's brilliant. Yeah. So if you I did a feminist it. version, what would you? Well, mean? yeah. Well, I, God, I don't yeah. know. I, but uh, yeah, basically from uh, what I was going to say is that anything from a monster movie to like a horror to a sweet you know indie film I basically want to write one of everything but I'm not going to live long enough because it takes me ages I'm very unprolific <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah it just takes me about two years a thing <laughs> it's worth the wait though as we can see from back to life <laughs> well Daisy will you stay on stage for our next guests and join in with them so we're very pleased to welcome our next guest in fact we're going to show a trailer because the third series of sex education is coming on Netflix on the 17th of September very popular and known to some of you I believe in this audience should we see a trailer let's do it Nice ride, Ames. Thanks. <laughs> Who's this? Me, that's Steve. No, Amy, the goat. Hey, sis. What's in your face? It's a moustache. I've been growing it all summer. I forgot to tell you, I saw Maeve the other day. I don't need to know what Maeve is doing anymore. Here are the students currently attending what has been dubbed the sex school. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, morning. How is everyone feeling today? Really good. I am your new head teacher. Seems that there are some students here who get a kick out of giving us a bad name. It changes today. Oh, what? I think I'm ready to, you know, really do a puff the night, girl. There is a battle happening in the sexual health of our teenagers. <gasps> I will get more down. Back on track. What is that? It's my shame sign. Sex will ruin your life. <gasps> no! You can't be teaching this stuff. It's backwards. I'm not getting involved anymore. Things are easier when you don't care. I don't think you stopped caring. I think you had your heart broken. What are you doing here? She needed a lift. That's convenient. The quicker you and your fragile little peers realise that you're not that special, the better. Listen up, everyone. We're all gonna die. Whoa, stop! Let's go! Come on! We live in completely different worlds, Amy. I just want to be the old me again. You may never be the old you, but that's okay. You can make things better. I'm not good at talking, but I want to change. You shouldn't ever give someone the power to humiliate you. You're great. It's the way you are. <laughs> so all over that. Brilliant. So my next guest is, as you may have guessed, an actress from Sex Education. She is Chinenya Ezadu. She plays Viv in Sex Education. She also starred in Netflix's The Stranger. And she's also going to be in the Paul Fage film, The School for Good and Evil, which releases on Netflix next year. She's all over Netflix. Please welcome Chinenya. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Do you know Hi. Daisy? No, there you go. You get to meet. <laughs> Welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, we're very, very excited by that trailer. Can you give us an idea of what's in store for Viv? She goes through a lot this season. Yeah. She has a new boyfriend. She, I know, right? Someone we know. Are you allowed to say? I'm not going to say okay, anything. Um, but yeah, she goes through a lot of shame this season um, in terms of sexting. It's definitely a changing of the guards. We have a new head teacher and she becomes head girl, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, she's going through a lot. It must be an interesting series to work on. <laughs> One of the, I think, my favourite episodes that you were involved in so far was when the girls were in detention. Has anyone here seen that episode? It's like the girls are in detention, they're getting some nods here, and they're setting an assignment saying, what have you got in common? The only thing they can find is sadly sexual harassment. It is such a powerful statement, that, and such a powerful episode. Can you talk to me a bit about filming that and, and the conversations you had both on and off set for that? I guess we didn't really know, like the impact of that scene when we were filming it. We just did it and um, we just hoped that it would get a good reaction. But when we were in it, we, I think we were all just really like supportive of each other. Um, yeah, like I kind of fucked up my lines at some point. 
Um, but they were just there to help me out because Viv says a lot of statistics. Um, I don't know if you know, she's like, and it's a lot. Um, but yeah, I think we were all definitely there for each other. And it's such a shame that we all bonded over it and sexual assault is such a big thing. But yeah, I'm really proud of the work we've done with it. It's sad, but it, sad. it doesn't surprise me because literally every woman I know has experienced something yeah. like that. And it was very important to see that episode that did that. What kind of reactions have you had from audiences? Everyone's loved it. And yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that it would go so global um, and resonate with a lot of people. Um, and if it just helps one person come forward... Yeah, that's enough. Absolutely. Well, it does feel like a show that has the power to make change, yeah. as well as being incredibly entertaining. Yeah. Um, was that one of the things that attracted you to being part of that show? I watched the series, the first series beforehand, um, and I was agentless. And I was like, how am I going to get into this series? Because I really loved it. I think it um, spoke about sex in such an unflinching way. So I contacted an agent, and I was like, hey, hey, bro, I know they're casting. So what are you going to do? Um, and then he got me on audition the next day and I just kept on going through the stages and I ended up getting Viv. Um, I think Viv is such an amazing character to play. She's so layered. I love that you just went, OK, I need to be in this show. Yeah, I was, I, yeah Let's make it happen. I was like, fuck it. It's Can like NLP that? visualization. I need to do that. Have you yeah. ever done that, Daisy? No, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that tonight. Yeah. yeah, just write it down. About my jaws. <laughs> yeah. I think let's make it happen. We can all learn from this. This is very good. And you've spoken out, of course, recently about um, the diversity and inclusion in the show, which I think is incredibly impressive. It doesn't feel like box ticking. It's very naturally integrated into the show. There's a lot of LGBTQ plus yeah. representation in the show. I think representation is always important because if you can see people like me, you know that you're going to work. And and if you don't see people like yourself, it feels like a barrier. Um, so it's nice to see people like Michaela Cole up there, um, Lashana. Seeing those people on stage and having such an amazing career just makes it possible for other people. Definitely. Well, you have some great scenes with Jackson, the character of Jackson. And th- one of our favourite scenes is coming up in a clip. Let's have a look. I've got a B plus in algebra. You know, that's not very impressive, right? So, do you want to do English or maths homework today? Well, actually, I was thinking of auditioning for the school play, but I don't understand Shakespeare, and I wondered if you could help me. Not my remit. Maths or English? Come on. Look, I've never got a B plus in algebra if it wasn't for you. I'm sure you've got some Shakespeare tricks up your sleeves. Please. You're not cute. <laughs> Why do you want to audition anyway? Well, I'm taking your advice and getting a backup plan. When I played Joseph in my primary school nativity, people said I was very believable. Of course you played Joseph. Come on, please. You're a tutor and genius. Fine. But this is a one-time thing. Yeah. Read me the speech. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she was. Why are you reading it like it's a shopping list? Because it makes no sense. It's poetry. Once you've got the rhythm, the words take on meaning. So each line has ten syllables made up of five heartbeats. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. You try. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief. So you've got the rhythm and the words. Now you need the emotion. This speech is about love. So try thinking of someone who makes you feel a lot when you say it. Brilliant. You're fabulous in that scene. Thank you. I haven't watched that in a while. I've changed. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> How does it feel watching that? It feels nice. I think he does amazing. He's so cute. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. I think that was one of my first scenes was that I really? filmed. Yeah. Wow. Perhaps. And me and Jackson have such a great 
the chemistry. You guys are so great together. Yeah. Hooked on your every word when you're in a scene together. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. I won't ask you any more questions about your boyfriend in the next series. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk a bit more about kind of the, the sex element of sex education. But um, broadly speaking, are, are you proud of what that series is doing? Because it's opening a lot of minds and it's showing young people things that I wish I'd seen when yeah. I was young. It just opens up the conversation about sex and just removes the shame aspect of it. And handles the conversation in a fun way. I think a lot of people relate to it, no matter what age you are. Definitely. I mean, a lot of people my age and older watch it. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's relevant to us all. And it, it gives me hope for the young. It does. Quite frankly, yeah. you're like, oh, good. If that's the examples they're getting now, that's fantastic. Yeah. And like the Dushin scene in particular with Chenille, not many people knew about it. I didn't as well until I like watched it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> literally sex education literally sex education literally does what it says yeah. in <laughs> and you're doing some very exciting things okay the school for good and evil which is based on the ya series and kerry washington is in this as well and charlie teron um, yeah. amazing cast what can you tell us about this not much oh darn it <laughs> but i can say that kerry washington is fantastic she's so so cool she's also like signing up a, a new production company if i'm not mistaken so that's really good to see like a, a black woman in power like doing her thing crushing it she's yeah. definitely on my dream list so could you tell us come on girls on film please that would i be will really i will Thank carrie you. if you're out yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> and what else are you working on i know there's some top secret stuff but can you hint? I literally just came back today from filming um, <laughs> Silent Raw, which is a film um, from the Isle of Lewis. So if I seem jet lag, it's because I am. <laughs> so, you know, work seems to be going pretty well for you. I hope so. Yeah. I'm writing. Um, hopefully I'm going to be writing with Alice, you know. Oh, um, this is good. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm developing something with the BBC. BBC, the BBC, um, and trying to do films. I'm quite like you. I'm, I'm trying to do bare things at once. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, there's a lot. There's a lot happening. of multitasking yeah. women, multi-hyphenate women on this stage right now. Yeah. I'm very impressed. I am woman, hear me roar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned um, Alice, so um, she is our next guest. She directed two episodes of the last series of Sex Education and has also written for Series 3. She's a filmmaker I'm very excited about. I've spoken to her before. She was named as a 2019 Screen International Star star of tomorrow and i quite agree she's currently show running her original series chloe for the bbc and amazon please welcome alice seabright and so of course you guys know each other yes you've worked together on sex education we did quite a bit we had quite a few scenes actually yeah and it was like viv's sort of entry into the the world of sex education so it was you know it was in the casting session when you first oh, came yes. in oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I did not it get out of here. <laughs> Those casting sessions, there's always like Scary. too many people. Oh, gosh. That there's always like, why terrifying. are there six people it's in horrible, here? Yeah. Isn't it? It was, it was it's horrible, isn't it? It's mean. <laughs> it just really is. Yeah. But I got the job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> crushed it. Yes. She walked in and, we, and did her thing and went out, and we were like, <laughs> oh. did we just meet Viv? You know? It was great. Oh. And yeah. How was it being part of the sex education family for you? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, I, I guess I was in a similar situation to Chini because I'd watched series one and just absolutely loved it. So I remember when I was meeting on series two, it's one of those things where, you know, when you're meeting for a job where you actually really want it <laughs> and suddenly you're like, it makes it easier to just come in and just be so excited, you know what I mean, to really uh, just, yeah, to kind of properly pitch for it. And yeah, and then it's such a great show to work on because, well, it was nice that like the world already was kind of set up, the crew and the cast kind of were already like all over it. It's such a fun one. being very humble. She was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Ginny. (laughs) But yeah, no, we had a great time. I think that's the main thing. I I guess just because of the topic, because of the writing's amazing. Laurie is just like the best Ben who's the lead director as well is just like a very kind of I don't know he just he sets the tone I guess and um and and so everyone just ha- has a like really fun time doing it and um we were going to have Ito O'Brien on this show um but sadly she couldn't make it she's an intimacy coordinator yeah. and she's worked with you on sex education as well as something else we're going to talk about in a little yeah. bit but talk to me a little bit about the experience of working with an intimacy coordinator and what that actually involves yeah the amazing Ita who was going to be here tonight and who um can't be here tonight but yes yeah, she's um She's kind of the intimacy coordinator. She sort of invented it pretty much because the insane thing is if you go back five years ago, it wasn't a thing, which means that when you film sex scenes, basically you just come in and go, I'll just go for it. I'll see what happens. Just 
like not the right way to be doing it. Obviously, there was a lot of problems all around. And what Eta did was she she basically came in and said, you know, you have a stunt coordinator for fight scenes, right? If you're going to do a fight scene, you agree on what the moves are going to be. You it's replicable, so you do the same thing each time. And you know, the stunt coordinator's there to what well, one make it look good and be believable, and two to make sure no one gets hurt, right? And with sex scenes, she says it's like it's the exact same thing. Daisy, yeah. you're nodding. Have you had experience oh, I just, of this? No, I, I haven't. And I'm just like, yes. Oh, so great. <laughs> I just think yeah. it's brilliant. It makes me so. I haven't had the experience of that. I've only had the other experience. Mm. So I'm just right. like, oh, I'm so happy that that's happening. I think it's, I think it's brilliant because you know it's a really vulnerable thing to do. Even just you know. To kiss someone or do anything, it's such a vulnerable thing, you know, so I think it's wonderful. The whole process is managed. So first of all, well, did, did you do the workshop that we did with Eta? Oh my God. It was like day one of prep. First she explains the theory and she tells you all about it, whatever. And then within about half, oh, and she sends you videos before oh, yeah. you start, which are like animal mating videos. <laughs> and so it's like uh, slugs. dogs, slugs are slugs. the best. You Google it on YouTube. It's what do they do? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of insane. What do they do? They join together in this wow. weird, like, sort of slurpy mess, and then they like turn, become one ball, and then they like come back. It's it's Quite like sexy. a lot of um, it is <laughs> very erotic. Like, yeah, erotic. a lot of fluids involved. <laughs> yeah, it's and so they watch one of these, and then you spend half a day basically getting on the floor making animal mating noises, <laughs> and I'm like, hi, I'm the director, nice to meet you. Like, you know, I'm a professional person, and then within in two minutes you're on the floor like making like sort of dog noises or whatever so it's a good icebreaker so everyone had to do that you had to do that as well I mean I loved it personally <laughs> it was kind of a, you know the first 10 minutes you're a bit like oh, this is awkward and then actually you just get really into it and it's but the reasoning like it sounds silly but the reasoning for it and it's very clever is that basically what she talks about is that you shouldn't be bringing your own sex life oh, to the scene right it's that like you're not there going like shit what is sex again what do I do you know and then and then you sort of feel weird and gross about it and 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 also it's exposing and it's just horrible all around what she talks about is that it's a choreography it's a piece of movement work you talk about like what does the character need in the scene and it's all agreed and choreographed so that it you know so that, again there's like consent every step of the way Best I actually want intimacy coordinators there all, all the time <laughs> even yeah. in scenes that aren't sex scenes I want them there they're just so amazing well, I love your passion for your job Alison and I've seen that in your, the short films that you've made, which I've really enjoyed. Oh, um, there's Pregnant Paws, which yeah. is, is terrific short film. And also Endo. Endometriosis is a big thing that a lot of women suffer from, a lot of women that I know. It kind of feels like a gender issue. Mm. Um, so is that one of the reasons you kind of wanted to make this film? Yeah, well, yes, all of those reasons. Um, the way it came about is that a very good friend of mine, Elaine Gracie, who's a very talented screenwriter, she had like a horrible doctor's appointment um, and came home and just kind of in a fit of rage, like wrote this draft of a script and just sent it to me. I was like, could this be the thing that we work on together? And I just loved the script because there was something very... Um, you could feel that it was kind of written in that from that place of yeah. just like raw, just like anger and but also with underneath it quite a lot of yeah. sadness and pain and stuff like that and the thing about Elaine is that she's very funny and she's just as a person she's also just quite um she deals with a lot of stuff through humor which I think that's why like I think humor's so great often you know like as Daisy does in her show you know you deal with with quite dark things through humans you can get to places that you can't necessarily without it let's so, have a anyway. look at a clip shall we sure yeah and did you find it problematic it's very common with your condition but sex doesn't necessarily have to mean intercourse you know there's foreplay uh, massage masturbation fondling even it can be common in the middle of your cycle for a cyst to burst no, I obviously want you to keep in mind. So, you have a condition where your balls are essentially in this heel device. And now I'm going to squeeze them and squeeze them. Let the squeezing commence. Really? Yes. And you don't know what causes it? No. Nope. And when will it end? It won't. Not unless you want to have them lobbed off. 
castration, let's call it. So no pitter patter of Tony footsies and it's not really a cure. Would you like that? No. But wait, wasn't it first diagnosed in around 1860? Yes. What exactly is your point? Well, good grief, exactly that. Something must be done. Painkillers? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, I think we all know what the point of that was. Um, absolutely brilliant. You can see Endo online, can't you now? Um, but finally, I want to talk about your very exciting show that you're currently working on, Chloe. Tell me about this. Oh, it looks very exciting. What the hell is it? Um, do you find this when you're making something you don't <laughs> yeah, know what it is? Can't I'm describe like, what it. Is it. I don't know. <laughs> it's about Becky. She's quite a tr tricky character. She lives with her, her mum, who's got dementia actually and is losing her memory. She's a temp worker, but she's quite. She's basically quite socially isolated. She doesn't really have a lot of friendships. She had this friendship, a very, very intense, close female friendship when she was in her teenage years, that ended um, with this girl called Chloe which is the name of the show, um, that ended and she now is in this sort of place where she doesn't really have any close relationships and she's sort of like, she'll take on different personas and she does quite a lot of sort of lying and presenting as different people and she's obsessed with her friend Chloe from when she was a teenager. She's constantly on her Instagram and stuff like looking at her life and her life seems so perfect, feeling envious of her life and shit about herself, whatever. And anyway, then she finds out that Chloe has died and her reaction, which is a very Becky thing to do, is that rather than just dealing with it and moving on she decides to meet the group of friends under a persona she, she calls herself Sasha and infiltrate the group of friends to try and find out more about what happened and process her own grief and kind of work out why her sort of friend with a seemingly perfect life has died I'm very intrigued yeah. um, identity female psychology yes, friendship oh ticking things. a lot of boxes for me and we can see that next year is that yeah, right it comes out in February fantastic well Alice thank you so much for joining us we're going to move on to the next section which you're all going to be involved with but thank you for telling us about your career Alice So I've asked a difficult question of you all for this one. It's basically like the one I hate as a film critic. What's your favourite film? And I'm like, oh, God. But I wanted to ask you to pick some of the things that you're really inspired by, whether they're female-led films or series. So, Daisy, your first one is a comedy that a lot of people know. Well, I mean, there are so many things that I, you know, like, you know, Dirty Dancing, Thelma and Louis, billions and billions of things. But for some reason, I said Bridesmaids because I remember watching Bridesmaids and just, like, crying because I was like, oh, God. God, they're, they're being so silly. Someone took a poo in the street. I'm so happy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's I the only felt, poo in a film scene yeah, that I love, I but it's hilarious. Like, yeah, I just felt really like seen. Not that I've done that, but just, <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, finally, like there's a bunch of women being complete pricks and it's okay and it just made me really feel happy yeah and by contrast your second contrast, choice I when I watched Unbelievable I, I found that really sort of moved me deeply because it was you know it was a story essentially of several men screwing up something so important and then two female uh, detectives t uh, solving something with such delicacy and heart that I was really moved by it. And it's based on a true case, And it's based case, on a true sadly. case where, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a Netflix series, so thank you for recommending that. So, Chinny, what have you got for us? I think it might be something that I know. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yes. I don't know if you've watched it. I haven't seen it yet. It's so, so good. good. <laughs> I, yes, I, I joined the chorus. It's so list. good. I've, I've already put too many films on my list, but that one and <laughs> Bridesmaids. One. Why do you love this one, Chinny? Yeah, well, I think films have always been under like the male gaze but this is one of the few rare ones that are, is just under the female gaze and it's so strong and it's about these two women who are just who just find love and they're hairy they're beautiful and they're just real and I just think there's something about this film that really resonates with me um, and it was yeah beautiful I agree it's a magical film yeah, and, yeah and we've spoken Please to two of the it. actresses in the current episode and of films <laughs> yes <laughs> Daisy you're gonna watch it aren't you I oh my see. god you're yeah so I'm dying so to. Good. I was already yeah. dying to, but now I'm extra dying to. Yeah, no, do it. Come with me. <laughs> Alice, you've chosen lots oh, I'm and so lots embarrassed. for us. No, I, I love that, though. I was like, I can't pick and one, and then list. I just I did the same thing. We're like, going to have some pictures popping up, but when the pictures pop up, you can tell yeah. us why you've chosen this one. 
Oh, so Stories this is we probably, tell. I just love this film so much. It's by Sarah Polly, who actually was an actress for a long time and then became a director. And it's a documentary, but it's a, do- it's a documentary about her own family. Her mum died when she, you know, and she, she investigates, she basically it starts from just making a film, wanting to make a film about her mum. But it then, I won't spoil it, but it, it, she finds out a lot of different things and it becomes this investigation into her family history. But it sort of becomes even more than that. It just becomes about, like, family and the narratives that we tell each other about who we are and where we come from. And, like, it's incredibly moving, but, like, also funny and weird and specific. And just, She's a fantastic oh, a director. Oh God, I recommend anyone so seek her out if you haven't seen her work. Um, Next yeah, up, The Diary of a Teenage film. Girl. Yeah, I just love this. I mean, I love uh, Mario Heller, and I think it's just such a great performance from her. And it felt like such a, again, seeing the story of a young girl, but told very much from her perspective and someone who'd experienced that it's just like just brilliant and funny and sad and Marielle's been on the podcast so you can search for that and uh, she's fantastic let's see what we've got next from you ah oh, raw <laughs> love it you were talking about her new yes, film wasn't it yes it's in the I same haven't seen it, Julia it's like it's it, it fulfills the promise mad. you'd expect from this, this mad film mad, yeah. why do you like this mad film it's, it's so um, it's got this really grounded and real tone but then it's got a cannibal uh, story to it basically it's about a woman who realises that she's a cannibal but it's kind of this metaphor for I guess female like something I don't know what it is like a, yeah there's a, a sexual desire, element to it I think yeah and kind of a desire that's like a bit obviously gross right because mm-hmm. you, you watch these scenes that can be actually quite off-putting but it, it's that feeling of like having something within you that is like unpalatable to the world around you and it's like very affecting as a female director you get so inspired because it's not that you, obviously I'm so inspired by films directed by men as well yeah. but it's different when you go oh you know you see yourself in that director and you feel like maybe I could do that too. Well, this is a fantastic viewing list so let's continue with the next one. I think um, a few people oh, might yes. have seen that one Lost in Translation. Yeah well that was an early one that I watched when I was a teenager in terms of like female directors that inspired me early on and it's, I just come back to that film quite a lot it's just really beautiful Daisy are you a fan of that one yeah that was I had the same experience with it It really blew my mind when I first watched it yeah she's a tremendous filmmaker and a fantastic list thank you for that so I also asked you all if there's a particular woman in the industry who's inspired you or one of many women who've inspired you uh, to pursue your own dreams or your projects Daisy has anyone sprung to mind I would say Laura Solon co-writer of Back to Life who I phoned eight months pregnant when we got the first the commission basically going I think I need to write it with someone will you do it please can you help me and um, I've always loved Laura she's a mate and she's just so clever and clear and has no ego and I remember thinking when I I realised I'd probably have to write it with someone because I was going to have a baby I just thought there's only one person I want to phone right now because I know that she will get that I'm going to be crazy about this and that it's my baby but she will help me and teach me and she's just been the best co-writer sort of partnership and really taught me a lot so I would say Laura Solon oh bravo Laura (laughs) nice one Janenia I have so many it's like picking your favorite child you have one but it's like (laughs) Um, one of many yes an example (laughs) um I think (laughs) obviously Alice here um she's been really supportive throughout and we're going to write something together, we're write aren't something we? together that, yeah, please. <laughs> nice. um, Greta Gerwig, I look up to her. I think she's such an amazing female director. Just a director. Mm. Um, Shaheen Baig is a casting director. She's um, amazing. She's amazing, isn't she? She helped me kind of get my agent. She gave me some really great advice that was to record myself doing a monologue and send it out to agents. And you know if they got it because they download it <laughs> on WeTransfer. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's kind of how I got my agent. So her, Lauren Evans, obviously has been a massive support and she cast me in this. So yeah, her, Kerry Washington, I'm going to throw that in there. <laughs> I, I think she, she gave me really great advice on set and I think she's such an amazing woman. So many women around me, like I look up to and inspire to be like, I think, yeah, everyone's great. Oh, that's wonderful. Alice, who springs to mind for you? Yeah. It's not me. Embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Chinenya. Oh, wow. You may have heard of her. Um, genuinely, though. Um, yeah, no, you're a very inspired because you're just like, you know, just doing it all. I feel like you've just got all of the passion and the drive to just feel like you're going you're gonna to run this roost pretty soon, aren't you? <laughs> Let's face it. Um, and actually, Laurie, uh, yes. who writes and creates sex education, she's just brilliant and has taught me so much. 
Lauren Evans is amazing. Um, I mean, yeah, definitely a lot of those directors that I sort of that are up there are big inspirations for me. I work with some amazing women on Chloe, Tally Garner, and Morvin Reed, who are absolutely brilliant uh, developers. And there's just a lot of good women. So many. I good mean, ones. I've got loads too. I thought it was only one. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to add some more names. Yeah. <laughs> Name a woman. <laughs> oh, God. Ella Jones. <laughs> Ella Jones. Ella Jones. Shout out to Ella Jones. Tonight, who is yeah, sorry. I just suddenly felt bad. I was like, Please. Oh, my other friends are going to no be one like, is why do you be only like one woman? <laughs> no. In fairness, I've mostly picked one myself, um, which is um, Dillis Powell. Um, so as a film critic, I'm kind of interested in her. That, that um, I only, to my shame, found out about her when I joined the critic circle. Um, but she was an, a very esteemed critic who wrote for the Sunday Times for over 50 years. And um, when I became chair of the critic circle film section in 2014, I discovered that there'd only been one other female chair in the whole history of the critic circle. And that was Dillis Powell nearly 40 years previously. Oh, God. Which was insane and I hope that there will very soon be another one I've stood down now but that kind of made me think wow she did an amazing thing because then that was really out there for her to mm. take that role and to, to be a prolific critic so her but I'm also inspired by women everywhere there you go I covered everyone yeah. um, <laughs> me too clever all of them watching <laughs> everyone especially here, ones that are kind films. as well yeah. at the same time yes. that's a real winner yeah, yeah. And by the girls on film team, you know, oh. we're, we're a massive team and I'm going to list everyone shortly. But first, I want to hear from the lovely audience. Um, audience, do uh, put your hand up and shout out any questions you have for my delightful panel here. Hi, Anna. Um, Hello. I've got a question for Daisy. I just wanted to ask, what was the first piece that you ever wrote and you felt as though you'd really created something that you wanted to put out into the world? I did write a film when I was 11, but it took me three years and then I hit puberty and it became awful. <laughs> Um, everyone suddenly was a sexy man drinking Diet Coke and painting walls. But I did think it was great. So that, <laughs> it was, oh gosh, I don't actually know. I'm going to go home and have a look. I might do, I might do a reading. It's so bad. <laughs> it's awful. You can see it was quite good. It was a bit pure. And then suddenly I get really horny. <laughs> and it just <laughs> It got really silly. Can you do a special reading like for our Patreon subscribers yeah. and it's like an extra with the I think the it was podcast. like, I definitely had Brad Pitt in it. He was definitely like painting some walls and suddenly topless and I had a wig and braces. I thought braces were very sexy and I was like, you know, I was like running away and stuff. It was awful. So this is your first piece of writing. This is my you really have to dig film, this out yeah. first. Thank you. A great question. Thank you. And there was a question here? Yeah. My question is about inspiration. So when you're writing, creating or like acting... Where do you like draw your inspiration from? Like, is it from like people you know? Uh, do you ever kind of write yourself, and then you like find yourself writing your own character? And also, do you ever think it's possible to write a story which you have like nothing to do with, or like you just have an experience? Maybe we start with Chinenya. Um Well, I created the character Viv off someone that I knew, and I think we all know someone like Viv, quite straight laced and just really ambitious. But I think when I first read the script, I was like. I kind of know what I want to do with this part. And I knew that she was going to be a quite fast talking, like 40 miles per hour speaking. And I was like, that is a clear character choice. And it just works for Viv. Um, and when I'm writing, I, I write about anything. I don't want to be in a box. I don't want to be like, oh, you can only write about um, the hood. Or I don't even know, like, like, like Shoreditch. I, I want to write about... <laughs> I can only write about shortage. Shortage. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to write about aliens. I want to write about random things. Like, I don't want to be put in a box ever. Anyone else want to reply to that one, Daisy? Daisy. Yeah. Daisy? Oh, no, I think that, um, you know, like, well, back to life, for instance, she killed, somebody killed somebody and I didn't kill anyone, but you, <laughs> not what? yet. Um, but I, um, I think that you can take something that you haven't lived, but then you imbue it with stuff that you know, you know, you can't help it. You Inspiration comes from everywhere. I, te I used to, like, well, before the pandemic, I used to write in a cafe because if I got bored, I could stop and listen in to people. So you find it anywhere you go and then you can write about anything, but you will find yourself you know, bringing parts of you and people around you into everything, I think. So if anyone's been sat in a cafe and they've spotted you, they might actually be in your next script. They may be. That's a bit spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, though. It's a great way to get inspiration. Anything you wanted to add to that, Alice? Like any character that you write, you to, to, in order to write them effectively, you have to sort of get into their head and then they end up being like a, a part of you that's in there or whatever. And you have to find your way in, which is, it can be totally abstract or emotional or whatever it doesn't have to be literal but then also I do steal 
things that happen in my real life and yeah, they'll never too. be friends with a writer like they will put you <laughs> in their script and your stories yeah very <laughs> embarrassing yeah brilliant thank you um yes just in the, in the in the white top yes uh, this is for alice actually um because i'm very interested in like queer representation uh, on screen especially like lesbian and bisexual women and obviously historically it's been incredibly bad or we've just like fallen back into really horrible tropes especially on tv like it's better but you've got like the barrier gay trope and stuff where lesbian characters just keep dying I, <laughs> I was just wondering like do you make like a conscious decision when you write queer storylines like on sex education or whatever to like go against those tropes and have you like personally seen like a shift in recent years of like queer representation on screen so speaking for sex education which i was in the room for but it's very much you know laurie nunn's show and she absolutely i mean basically just that room ends up being a discussion you know you talk about the characters you talk about people's experiences you talk about what you want you know what you want to put on screen but inevitably you we also end up talking about what's been on screen before what are you know tropes that that we want to avoid what are things that are boring and you know ju just because it is important i think to, to to try and kind of work out you can't like differentiate say like oh over here there are bad people making bad things with bad tropes and I'm here making great stuff we all consume media and culture and have you know learned a lot of these like you can find yourself writing tropes that are lazy if you don't think about it enough and so I think it's quite important to interrogate your own writing and and be aware that's a very good point about picking yourself up on unconscious bias and also not mm. self-blaming or not blaming other people because we're all prey to it yeah and it should yeah. be part of the process and and it means if you set up a, a situation in a room for example where you can have those conversations without people getting defense you know and i when you have great collaborators and writers and stuff it isn't a defensive thing it's like oh okay cool well let's be better and let's you know find other ways to do it and stuff any last questions at the front here yes so what first drew you to the role of Viv and then how do you go through the process of picking characters for future roles? So what drew you to Viv and how do you pick your future roles? Viv was kind of like me during school so I just felt this connection and bond with her and it, it, she was a character that I really just wanted to play um, and how I go about choosing characters. I think it's very much script based and, and director um, so I kind of researched the director um, who's doing it and I'm like, oh, I love their work. I would love to work with them. Um, and then I see, then I read the script, obviously. Um, and most times they're great. Because I, I just worked with um, Paul Feig, who did Bridesmaids. Oh. And so cool. <laughs> so yeah, cool. he's such a gentleman. And like he comes on set with like the best suits mm -hmm. you could ever see. And he gave us a lot of room for improvisation, which is something I really look for in directors. And you did that as well, um, which is really fun. And Paul Feig is another man, because we do have men occasionally on Girls of Film, uh, that sorry. I would like on the podcast. So if you could have a word I will with him as well, that I'll would talk be great. To She'll sort it. Don't Thank worry. you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. brilliant. <laughs> yeah. He makes great films about women. He does. Right? He really so does. So that is to be applauded, because we welcome our allies, including those in the room. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much to my contributors today. Thank you to Daisy, to Chinenye, and to Alice. Thank you so much thank for joining you. Girls on Film. Yes, bravo. You've been amazing, you three. I could talk to you all night. Absolutely brilliant. And big thanks to the London Podcast Festival for having us. You guys are fantastic. Thank you to Hedda Archbold for producing. Round of applause to Hedda. Yes, at the front here. Amazing work. Heather Dempsey at the back for assistant producing. Jess Moon for interning. Um, our principal partner, Peter Brewer, who we're very grateful to. And uh, for all you lot for turning up, thank you so much. And um, do remember to download the Girls on Film podcast. Meantime, thank you all so much for being Girls on Film. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Girls on Film, which is an HLA production. We'll be back soon with our episode on the film Respect, and we'll also be talking to the great Karen Gillan. See you then. Stay safe. We're a team and we are exceptional.